Much love and respect. Thanks for tuning in once again. In today's video, well, that when we're reading about Hercules, sometimes I mention, is this AKA Samson? Is Hercules and Samson the same character? The funny thing is I actually found a book that dedicated a whole chapter talking about the same possibility that Hercules and Samson are one and the same. So we're just going to read that today. Hope you guys enjoy it. So we're going to read from this book. We've read it before. A couple of chapters. A lot of great info here. We're going to get into. There's two volumes of this. And of course, we're always going to dodge the hijack when we see it. The book is Anacalypsis. An attempt to draw aside the field of the Saitic Isis. Or an inquiry into the origin of languages, nations, and religions. By Godfrey Higgins. This is volume one. This is written in 1836. All right, so we're going to belly flop all the way to book five. Yeah, there's actually many books in this volume. I believe uh, 10 books in this one volume. So we go to book five, chapter six. It says here, Hercules and Samson the same. Etymology of Samson. Mutra, Hercules, at Drummond on Hercules, the foxes. Wilfred on Hercules at Mutra, meaning of word Hercules, Hercules Black, Krishna, and Egypt. All right, Hercules, so-called Black. I shall now proceed to exhibit some other circumstances to prove that the god of the Western and Eastern Asia was the same. In the particulars of the god Hercules, some striking marks of the identity of the two will be found. In his adventures, also, a number of facts may be perceived which identify him with the Samson of the Jews and the Krishna of India. Okay? Samson is explained by Kalmet and Cruden to mean his son. This explanation I greatly doubt. Samson answers correctly to the Hindu incarnation Shama or Shama Yaya, which is one of the thousand names of Vishnu which the Hindus repeat in their litanies, as is done by the Romish Christians. Baal Iswara was the son of the Shama and the Sem Iramis of Ashur, of scripture, all right, Semiramis. Several of the early Christian fathers, and along with the Sincellus, acknowledged the identity of Samson and Hercules, who they say was copied by the Gentiles from the Bible copied, duplicated by the Gentile so-called Greeks, is a mythos. The whole story of Samson, the Philistines, the lion, Tamath or Tamus, is a mythos. It is explained by Dupuis, Surtus Lecultes, and his assertion on the labors of Hercules. Mr. Favor says, on the spear, he, Hercules, is represented in the act of contending with the serpent the head of which is placed under his foot. And this serpent, we are told, is that which guarded the tree with golden fruit in the midst of the garden of the Hesperides. Again, where? In the Hesperides. 
we know that the Greeks meant America when they meant Hesperides. But the Garden of the Hesperides, as we have already seen, was no other than the Garden of Paradise. Consequently, the serpent of that garden, the head of which is crushed beneath the heel of Hercules, and which itself is described as encircling with its folds the trunk of the mysterious tree, must necessarily be a transcript of that serpent whose form was assumed by the tempter of our first parents. We may observe the same ancient tradition in the Phoenician fable respecting Ophion or Ophionius. The reader will not dispute the authority of the orthodox faber. Would he wish for a more decisive proof that Genesis is a mythos, as the Reverend Dr. Gides properly calls it? If he do, let him consult Monsignor Dupuy, Surtus le Cultes, where Mr. Faber acquired his knowledge, though he wishes to keep Mr. Dupuy's fine work in the background. The situation of the foot of the celestial Hercules on the serpent's head pretty well identifies him with the Krishna of Genesis and India. Parkhurst admits that the labors of Hercules are nothing but the passage of the sun through the signs of the zodiac and the circumstances relating to him he adopts as emblematic memorials of what the real savior was to do and to suffer. The name of Hercules being, according to him, a title of the future savior. He could not foresee that the origin of Hercules was to be found in India. What India? <laughs> the etymology of the name Samson and his adventures are very closely connected with the solar Hercules. Samsa was the name of the sun. Among the Arabians, by Samsa was the name of a city of their country, which was the same as Heliopolis or city of the sun. Isidore of Seville says that the name of Samson signifies the solar force or power. That is, he defines it as Macrobius defines Hercules. Whatever may be the origin of the name, so they really don't know the origin because they're saying whatever. We know that Samson was of the tribe of Dan, or of that which is the astrological system of the Rabbins, was placed Cassi under Scorpio, or under the sign with which the celestial Hercules rises. He became Amorius, of a daughter of Tamnis. In going to seek her, he encountered a furious lion, which, like Hercules, he destroyed. Sincello says of him, in this time lived Samson, who was called Hercules by the Greeks. Okay? Some persons maintain nevertheless, as he, that Hercules lived before Samson, but traits of resemblance exist between them which cannot be denied. Okay, so again, he got a lot of sources. You can see the footnotes. You can see where he's getting all this from. People did say all this stuff. Just got to know how to discern and dodge the hijack, but pull out the babies for sure. It is not surprising that Mr. Parkhurst should be obliged to acknowledge the close connection between Hercules and Jesus as the fact of Hercules and the ancient spear treading on the head of the serpent leaves no room for doubt on this subject and also identifies him with Krishna of India, who is seldom seen without the head of the cobra beneath his foot. And these two facts at once locate Krishna before the Christian era. All right, so, you know, Jesus also stepping on the foot or Mary, you know, that's all adopted from what they're telling you. This is from older cultures. And as he's telling you right here, Krishna is also seen doing the same thing in many uh, drawings or paintings. The identity of Krishna and Hercules has been shown. Christian priests say that the man treading on the head of the serpent is an emblem of Jesus. That's what Christians say. Then here we have the same emblem of Krishna, Hercules, and Jesus. Whether this will prove the identity of the three, I leave to the devotees. It surely proves the identity of the doctrine of mythos. It, certainly, it surely proves the identity of the doctrine or mythos of the second book of Genesis, of Greece, and of India. I am not surprised that the reverend and superstitious Parkers should state Hercules to be an emblem of the future savior. How could any person who had eyes avoid seeing the identity of the history of the two? However, let me not be abused for first seeing this. It was the pious Parkers who discovered it. I only repeat his words, and I have no inclination to dispute his explanation of the mythos. Colonel Wilford says, 
that Megasthenes reckons 15 generations between Dionysius and Hercules, by the latter of whom he observes we are to understand Krishna and Bala Rama. He adds, it appears that like the spiritual rulers of Tibet, Deo Nawish did not, properly speaking, die, but his soul shifted its habitation and got into a new body whenever the old one was worn out, either through age or sickness. Here we have the true system of incarnations and the metempsychosis, whether there be in the Hindu mythos an incarnation called Balarama between Bacchus, that is Dionysius, that is Taurus, and Hercules, that is Krishna, that is Ares, or not, is of no consequence. It may have been the fact. It will not affect the general argument. But Balarama is said to be the same as Krishna. The two grand incarnations, whether called Balarama or by whatever other name, were those of Buddha and Krishna. After the equinox began in Taurus, they were all incarnations of Buddha until the sun entered Aries, and after his entrance into Aries of Krishna, and both were incarnations of Vishnu, or of the Trimurti. By the word generation used above, I apprehend is meant century. Then if we admit that Balarama was the incarnation, as I am inclined to believe he was, of the cycle next before Krishna, and if to and if to the 1500 we add 600 his cycle, this would bring us to the year 2100 from the sun's entrance into Taurus to his entrance into Aries for the incarnation of his successor, Krishna. Balarama is constantly held by the present ignorant Brahmins to be the same as Krishna. This is because he was the next previous incarnation. The nearness of the two connected also with the fact that they were in reality renewed incarnations or regenerations of the same person prevents the Brahmins from seeing the distinction. Besides, he was the same in another sense. He was the sun in the equinoctial sign of Aries and in the cycle of the Neros, both running at the same time and crossing each other in their progress. The old statues of the gods at the famous Mutra or Mathurea have been destroyed by the Mohammedans and the new ones have been erected in modern form, and in consequence have no resemblance to those described by Megasthenes, but at a place called Baladeva, about 13 miles from Mutra, there is a very ancient statue, which minutely answers to his description. It was visited some years ago by the late Lieutenant Stewart, who describes it in the following words. Balarama, or Baladeva, is represented there with a plow share in his left hand, with which he hooks his enemies, and in his right hand a thick cudgel, with which he cleft their skulls. His shoulders are covered with the skin of a tiger. Is it a tiger or jaguar? Captain Wilford adds, here, I shall observe that the plowshare is always represented very small, and sometimes omitted, and that it looks exactly like a harpoon with a strong hook or a gaff as it is usually called by fishermen. My pundits inform me also that Balarama is sometimes represented with his shoulders covered with the skin of a lion. Our account of Samson and the bone of the ass is probably some misunderstanding of the text or a corruption. I feel little doubt that the gaff and the bone were the same thing, whatever they were. On most of the Egyptian monuments, a priest is seen with a litus or crozier of a peculiar shape this I take to have been the Hieralpha, described by Kircher, and the plowshare in the hand of Balarama just mentioned. This is confirmed by a passage of Diodorus Siculus respecting the rites of the priests of Ethiopia and those of the Egyptians. The several colleges of priests, they say, observe one in the same order and discipline in both nations. For as many as are so consecrated for divine service are wholly devoted to purity and religion and in both countries are shaven alike, and are clothed with the like stoles and attire, and carry a scepter like unto a plowshare, such as their kings likewise bear, with high-crowned caps, puffed at the top, wreathed round with serpents called asp, by which it seemed to be signified that those who contrive anything against the life are as sure to die 
as if they were stung with the deadly bite of an asp. Here I think the litus, which is seen so often and is called a plowshare, is meant. The image of Baladeva is probably that of Krishna. The Hindus know little about the names of their gods. Baladeva is but one of the names of Krishna and Buddha. Sir William Drummond says, I have already observed that Gaza signifies a goat and was the type of the sun in Capricorn. It will be remembered that the gates of the sun were fiend by the ancient astronomers to be in Capricorn in Cancer, from which signs the tropics are named. Samson carried away the gates from Gaza to Hebron, the city of conjunction. Now Count Gebelin tells us that at Cadiz, where Hercules was anciently worshipped, there was a representation of him with a gate on his shoulders. Listen to that. The story of Samson and Delilah may remind us of Hercules and Omphale. Lehi, Ilhi, a jawbone. It will be remembered that in the first decan of Leo, an ass's head was represented by the Orientalist. The Ramath Lehi means the high place of the jawbone. Samson had seven locks of hair, the number of the planetary bodies. The yellow hair of Apollo was a symbol of the solar rays, and Samson with his shaven head may mean the sun shorn of his beams. Golni says, Hercules is the emblem of the sun. The name of Samson signifies the sun. Hercules was represented naked, carrying on his shoulders two columns called the gates of Cadiz. Samson is said to have borne off and carried on his shoulders the gates of Gaza. Hercules is made prisoner by the Egyptians, who want to sacrifice him, but while they are preparing to slay him, he breaks loose and kills them all. Samson, tied with new ropes by the armed men of Judah, is given up to the Philistines who want to kill him. He unties the ropes and kills a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. Hercules, the son, departing for the Indies, or rather Ethiopia, all right, the West Indies, Hesperides, and remember, the South Atlantic was called the Ethiopian Sea, and conducting his army through the deserts of Libya, feels a burning thirst and conjures Ihao, his father, to succor him in his danger. Instantly, the celestial ram appears. Hercules follows him and arrives at a place where the ram scrapes with his foot and there comes forth a spring of water, that of the Hyads or Eridan. Samson, after having killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass, feels a violent thirst. He beseeches the god Ihao to take pity on him. God makes a spring of water to issue from the jawbone of an ass. Okay, same thing. And Volney then goes on to show that the story of the foxes is copied from the pagan mythology and was the subject of a festival in Latium. The labors of Hercules are all astronomically explained by Monsignor Dupour in a manner which admits of no dispute. They are the history of the annual passage of the sun through the signs of the zodiac, as may be seen on the globe, it being corrected to the proper aera and latitude. The story of the foxes with the fire branch is vindicated by Ovid. Passages which imply, though the author himself affirms the contrary, more than a solitary instance of mischief, to justify a general and annual memorial, and is farther explained by Lico Frons and Suidas. The Roman festival, Vulpium Combustio, recurred about the middle of April, when, as Bouchard in his Hieros remarks, there was no harvest in Italy. Hence, it must have been imported from a warmer climate. Bouchard says, in memory of Samson's foxes, they were let loose in the circus at Rome about the middle of April, foxes with firebrands, whereunto appertains that which the Boetians, who sprang partly from the Phoenicians, boast of themselves that they could kindle anything by means of a torch affixed to a fox, and that of Lycophrom, a Cilician, by whom a fox is termed from his shining tail, or from a torch bound to its tail. All right, so they're descendants of Phoenicians. What is a Phoenician? Where are Phoenicians coming from? Let's not forget the previous videos. The same Bouchard tells us that the great fish which swallowed up Jonah, although it be called a whale, 
forget it was not a whale properly so called, but a dog fish called Charcharias. Therefore, in the Grecian fable, Hercules is said to have been swallowed up of a dog and to have lain three days in his entrails. Which fable sprang from the sacred history, touching Jonah, the Hebrew prophet, as is evident to all. All right, he's letting you know they took that Hercules story from Jonah, from the Bible. Hesekiel says that by Cetus, which we translate whale, was meant a large ship and bulk like a whale. Mr. Bryan says that when Andromeda is said to have been carried away by a sea monster, this was probably only a ship, perhaps by pirates. Respecting the Hercules of India, Captain Wilford says Diodorus Siculus, speaking of Palibotra, affirms that it had been built by the Indian Hercules, who, according to Megasthenes, as quoted by Arian, was worshipped by the Suraseni. The chief cities were Metoru and Trisobora. The first is now called Mutra. In Sankras, it is called Matura and other Mugunagur by the Muslims and Kalisapura by the Hindus. The whole country about Mutra is called Surasena to this day by learned Brahmins. The Indian Hercules, according to Cicero, was called Belus. He is the same as Bala, the brother of Krishna, and both are conjointly worshipped at Mutra. Indeed, they are considered as one avatar or incarnation of Vishnu. Bala is represented as a stout man with a club in his hand. He is called also Balarama. To decline the word Bala, you must begin with Balas, which I conceive to be an obsolete form, preserved only for the purpose of declension and etymological derivation. The first A in Bala is pronounced like the first A in America, in the eastern parts of India. But in the western parts and in Benares, it is pronounced exactly like the French E in the pronouns je, me, etc. Thus, the difference between Balas and Belus is not very great. As Bala sprung from Vishnu or Heri, he is certainly Heri Kula. Heri Kulas and Hercules. Here we see that Baal, Bull of Assyria and Ireland, all right, Ireland, the true Chaldea. The Bell of Syria and Phoenicia and the Bellinos of Gaul. Krishna is evidently Hercules, and Bala Rama is a strong Bala. Rama is the Greek, to Bell I shall return presently. It seems here convenient to inquire a little further into the meaning of the word Hercules. This word is admitted to be neither Greek nor Latin. Then I think we must look for it to the barbarians. He is called in the Dionysiacon, Astris Amictus, Rex Ignus, Princeps Mundi Sol, etc. He was called, I learn from Valenci, Ere Coel, that is, and he gives all these numbers right here, right? In my Celtic Druids, I have shown that this practice of describing persons by letters as numbers was common, the origin of which I shall endeavor to demonstrate in a future book both in writings and in the numbers of pillars in the ancient circular temples which are equally common in India and Europe. I ask, may not the word Hercules have been derived from Hedi, the Savior? And, let me give you the numbers right here, which was sacred among the Egyptians under the shape of a cat and which, in their language, had this name? Their cat mummies may be seen in the British Museum then he would be the savior of the Neros, or the Mem, final of Isaiah, the ex of Plato. By and by we shall find several other examples of gods whose names had the meaning of more than one cycle. As Hercules was called Hericules, so Mercury was called Mercoles, right? Miercoles, like how we say Wednesday in Spanish, Miercoles, that is Mercury. Mercoles, or Mercolis, the med, I do not understand. The colis is the clo of the Chaldees, the Kali of India, and the kol or kal of Ireland. Colonel Wilford speaks of a god called Haraja or Harakula. Here, Harry, the savior, 
and the god Ie are identified with Hercules or Krishna. The word Heri in Sanskrit means shepherd as well as savior. Krishna is called Heri and Jesus is always called shepherd. He is the leader of the followers of the Lamb. He is the good shepherd as was also Krishna. In Ireland, a shepherd is called Sheferi or Sheep Aire. See General Valencia Osili's Col Orient, page 315, where he proves that the riots of India were known in Ireland and where the Arakoti famed for linen gear of Dionysius. All right, you see that? The connection with Ireland here. In this case, there will be two origins for the name of Hercules. And this is certainly mystical enough, but it must be recollected that we are now in the center of the land of mystery. Krishna is constantly called Hari Krishna. This is the black, all right? Again, this is the black, but it may be the beneficent or good savior or good Hari. For Krishna may come from some old word. Whence came the Greek word, bonus. He was called Krishna in Ireland, okay? Krishna. I have proved that all the very ancient languages are the same, mere dialects, and I will not be fettered in my search after truth either by one language or another. The utility of my endeavor, first to prove the identity of the ancient systems of letters and language, I hope is obvious. It is no more likely that the black Hindus should call their God the Black Savior or Heri, then it is that the white French should call Henry Quatre their white Henry. But it is as natural for them to call him the good Savior as for the French to call their king their good Henry. It is certain that in Sanskrit, Chris means black, okay? Krishna, Chris means black in Sanskrit. Do you guys hear that? Krishna, Chris means black so-called black, and in Greek, there goes the writing, means good. He may therefore have been named from both words. On the subject of the word, I shall have much to say hereafter. Arian says, on the authority of Megasthenes, that the Indian Hercules had the same habit as the Theban Hercules, and that he had an only daughter called Pandeya. This was precisely the same name as that which was given to the only daughter of Krishna, to whom he left a mighty empire, the Pandayan kingdom. In addition to all the other circumstances of identity between Krishna and Hercules, is the fact that they were both blacks, so-called blacks, all right, Krishna and Hercules, of Hercules Homer, in what Nimrod calls his genuine verses, thus speaks. Black he stood as night, his bow uncased, his arrow strung for flight, okay? That's how Homer described Hercules, a very dark complexion man. In B4, chapter 1, section 13, I have shown from Mr. Bryan that the last syllable in the word Maturea, Re, meant the sun. The first syllable, I suspect, was the Hebrew, Mete, which meant a resting place, a couch, a bed, a sofa, or sofa. This is, as the ray was a ray of the sun, which was wisdom, or Sophia, a place of wisdom, a resting place of divine wisdom, a divan, that is, divana, or holy place, where in the Asiatic courts, in the sofa, on which the king reposes to administer justice. From the same idea, I have no doubt it was that the kings of the Franks, or as in a future page, I shall prove them, the kings of the Sakae, or Saxons, okay? Who are the Saxons? The sons of Isaac. This same author we read in volume two, another chapter of his books and writings, he showed the correlation which we already had made. So the kings of the Sakae, or Saxons, had their beds of justice. In the Maturea of India, Krishna spent his youth after taking refuge there from the tyrant who strove to destroy him. And in the Maturea of Egypt, Jesus Christ is said, as we have before shown to have spent his youth after he took refuge there from the tyrant Herod. All right. Again, stories repeating. 
Mr. Maurice has pointed out a passage of Eusebius from which it seems probable that the Krishna in Egypt was well known in his time. He says that at Elephantina, they adored another deity in the figure of a man in a sitting posture, painted blue, having the head of a ram with the horns of a goat encircling a disc. The deity thus described is plainly of astronomical origin, denoting the power of the sun in Aries. It is, however, exceedingly remarkable that Pokoki actually found and on his 40th plate has engraved an antique colossal statue of a man sitting in the front of this temple with his arms folded before him and bearing in his hand a very singular kind of litus or crozier. I think there can be hardly any doubt that the figure described by Eusebius was that of Krishna or Buddha. There was a city in Egypt called Heracleopolis. It does not appear to me to be more surprising that there should be two Matureas, one in India and one in Egypt, than that there should be two islands of Elephanta in which the statues of Krishna should be found. One near Bombay, where the famous cavern is seen, and one is Upper Egypt. Everyone knows the fact that our sepoys discovered their favorite god Krishna when they arrived in Egypt during the last war, and which, very naturally, they immediately fell to worshiping. This alone at once proved the fallacy of all the deductions which are drawn from the astronomical calculations and reasonings of Mr. Bentley, on which I will now make some observations and may serve to show how little the abstruse and complicated chains of reasoning used by him can in any case be depended on. The fact of the god Krishna being found in the ruins of old temples at Thebes and Egypt of itself settles the question of his antiquity, for it cannot be put there after the birth of Christ. We have seen above that, that the striking similarity between the vulgarly received Jesus of Nazareth and Hercules cannot be denied by the learned and orthodox Parkers, and we have also seen the mode in which he accounts for it. I have fairly stated the facts for the consideration of my reader, who must see at once that if the explanation of Parkhurst be satisfactory for Hercules, the same explanation will serve for Krishna. And in honest inquiry into the superstitions of the world, I could not conceal the circumstances relating to Krishna, and there are many others which I shall state. Of course, I cannot condemn any one for being satisfied by Mr. Parkhurst's judgment that it is not satisfactory to me may be readily accounted for from an opinion which I entertain, that I can and shall account for the facts in a very different and more satisfactory manner when I come to that part of my work where I shall undertake to prove that a person usually called Jesus Christ did live and that the doctrines which he taught were true. Dodge the hijack. What are we talking about? When we're talking about Joshua? Are we talking about Joshua? David? Moses? Hosea, I must beg my reader to recollect that in this work I am not writing for the ignorant, nor to gratify the passions of any class, but that it is the object of my work to develop and unveil the secret history of the ancient world, which operates influentially upon us, that it is meant for legislators and philosophers to enable them the better to determine what is the most expedient course for them to pursue for the good of their fellow creatures all right and that's the end of this chapter and uh calling us creatures and stuff right so you know we dodged the hijack you know i don't doubt that joshua the guy who delivered the israelites you know helped them during the, finish the exodus i don't doubt he was real i don't doubt king david so-called prester john was real and i don't doubt that real people existed especially amongst the ancestors of the so-called Hebrews that had a lot of impact in the world and that their stories became myths. And also, just like the American Indians told their history and oral traditions using mythology and astrology, that it was the same with a lot of these so-called biblical characters. That's kind of why I want to read this. Look, I just thought it was interesting that they were comparing Samson and Hercules and their whole correlations because to me it kind of makes sense a little bit 
Now, this guy's a straight, straight up Christian, <laughs> as you guys saw at the end here. So that's why I say we got Dust the Hijack. Of course, everybody has their biases. But I hope you guys enjoyed this little reading. This book is very interesting. A lot of his theories do make sense, and uh, he does have a lot of sources for what he's saying. So, you know, I like that. I follow up on the sources. And then I, you know, pull out the babies and interpret it myself. I hope that's what you guys are doing. Before I go, I just want to read this little footnote. It says here, number two, it says, In one of the plates of my Celtic druids of a round tower in Scotland, the crucified Savior has a lamb on one side and an elephant on the other. How came an elephant to be thus found in Scotland? Uh, good question. What was the British Isles really in ancient times? Thanks for tuning in once again. Much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Hawaii.